CEO Executive Coach Harold Hillman joins me on the line. Morning to you, Harold. Good morning, Mel. So I'm glad you're up because I, I'm always worried on a on a daylight saving day that people aren't going to check their watches correctly and they're going to miss I things. I didn't realise it um, until I woke up this morning and I looked at the clock and it was, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure you're not alone there. Let's talk yes. about imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? It is a um, imposter syndrome is a pretty common um, phenomenon in people, uh, especially those who put a lot of pressure on themselves to succeed. So it tends to correlate with um, people who have high drive, high achievement need, um, a tendency towards perfectionism, uh, people who put a lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect. And, um, and so it happens when you are promoted into a bigger role or you're asked to step up and do something different. Um, you are, you, 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 this role may be new. No one's ever been in it before, and there you are. And um, it, it's, the, it, it's a, um, um, I call it a, an extreme sense of vulnerability, and that is that you're afraid that people are going to um, uh, discover that you are not competent for the position when, in fact, you are. And um, it, it, it happens to most people now. Roughly 75% of the population will experience imposter syndrome at some point in, uh, in their life. It was a, a, a term that was first used in, back in 1978 by two American psychologists, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. And they were focused at that point on women who were breaking through the glass ceiling at the time and landing at executive tables in roles that had traditionally been reserved for men. So the first focal point on imposter sy syndrome was around um, women who would then, once they landed at that table, um, began to, again, uh, feel like if they failed, all women failed. Um, but then uh, over the, uh, the last three decades or so, the research has expanded and it's really reinforced the fact that men, women, all people, uh, most people um, will, will experience imposter syndrome, particularly when they're on a learning curve and put more pressure on themselves to succeed. Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? I have, Mel. This is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, um, Imposter Syndrome, in 2013, because I wanted to normalize what is a common phenomenon. The interesting thing about imposter syndrome is that when you're going through it, you don't think anyone else will be able to understand, so you're less likely to talk about it, even though most people around the table will um, have experienced it at some point. And so part of my uh, reason for writing the book in 2013 was to normalize it. I, ex I experienced it. I remember um, uh, going uh, ex when I was accepted to graduate school at Harvard University in 1978, and there I was sitting with um, all of these kids white students who had gone to private schools all their lives and I felt like oh my goodness gracious what am I doing here and I did actually, I did very well at Harvard I received um, um, all A's and one B and um, but the, the thing about it was I didn't have a lot of fun mm -hmm. I studied a lot I put a lot of pressure on myself to you know to be this perfect person in my first corporate role at Amico at Amico Corporation an oil company in the States. Uh, and it was my first corporate role. And I was leading a team of 20 people. And I had never had any corporate experience. I, the biggest team I had ever led before that was three people. And so there I was. And, um, and I, the pressure, particularly with people who were older than me on the team, more experienced with them than me um, in that respect. And then even I, I write in the, in, the, uh, in the book, I write about even coming to New Zealand to work with Fonterra in 2003, and I thought, oh my God, I don't know anything about dairy. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. I com completely overlooking all of my qualifications to be in the role and the fact that they hired me because I was different, not in spite of it. <laughs> and so um, I can relate to it. And then at a very personal level, Mel, 
um, but it was just based on my assumption as a kid, a gay kid, um, that being gay was something bad and that people judged you harshly for being gay. So I did a very good job as an imposter for the better part of my adult life until mm -hmm. my early 40s when I finally came out. Um, I had lived most of my life um, impersonating a straight man, even as an officer in the U.S. Air Force when it was illegal to be gay. So I felt qualified to write a book about imposter syndrome because I felt like I had worn that mask um, a good deal of my life. <laughs> I think so. Overqualified indeed. Uh, what about vulnerability? How does that factor into imposter syndrome? Um, I, I define vulnerability as your relationship with imperfection. And that is that um, there is no such thing as a perfect person, but there are some people who really do put a lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect. And so um, um, vulnerability is this fear of imperfection. It's the fear of being exposed. Um, and, um, and, and people who struggle with uncertainty. And so the, the reaction is twofold. If you, if you have a negative relationship with imperfection, you're either going to be too hands-on, and that is just, you know, where you start to micromanage and get real defensive and rigid, or you're going to be too hands-off, and that is pulling away from the scenario there. Um, a person who does well with vulnerability is better at dealing with situations when they, um, when, they when, when, when scenarios unravel where we don't have a lot of control over it. For example, the last 20 months um, in this world where um, there's been no playbook associated with how we navigate through COVID. A person who needs to be perfect, a person who puts pressure on themselves to be, um, to have everything nailed down, will have struggled significantly during this period of time. This period, the, the last 20 months has really been a great test of whether or not people are comfortable navigating their way through uncertainty um, and being on a learning curve. The, uh, and, uh, again, people who experience imposter syndrome when they're on the learning curve aren't, uh, aren't particularly compassionate with themselves. Mm. So how do you beat it then? How do you beat imposter syndrome? Is this something that you can actually put behind you permanently? I mean, I'm just thinking about my life. I've, everybody, I think, has dealt with imposter syndrome, at least at some stage in their lives. Yeah, again, uh, pr uh, pretty common, especially um, uh, when you're promoted into a bigger role, that type of thing. So it, might, it, it, could, it could be a first-time CEO, a first-time uh, ch uh, chair of a board, um, a, a first-time mother, a new mother holding her baby for the first time and, and you know, just experiencing these doubts about um, whether or not they're going to be able to um, live up to the role. Um, and so it, it really is a big part of it is, is self-talk, what I call going inward and self-awareness and getting comfortable with imperfection. Mel, Mel there, are, there are people out there who really do strive to be 100% perfect, and that is a losing proposition. And so people need to be a little bit kinder and compassionate to themselves in terms of going up that learning curve and uh, realizing that they're going to make mistakes, they're not going to have all the answers, and those types of things are, are really important. So redefining um, imperfection as the norm as opposed to perfection. Uh, it's also helpful to realize that you cannot grow. You cannot grow without stretch, whether in your personal life or in your professional life. You've got to get on a learning curve. It's the basic principle behind building muscle. It's also how you build confidence and, and resilience. We've talked about this before. Mm. So you have to put a more positive frame on what it means to be vulnerable. Um, and particularly if you're a team leader, you can't ask other, people's, other people to stretch themselves if you're not willing to do the same. And so there, it is, there is a comfort level there around it. I also talk about um, the the, 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 um, the gray, that gray is larger than black and white. 
And by that, I mean that ambiguity and uncertainty are far bigger spaces than that narrow, than that very narrow sphere of black and white certainty. So just having people get comfortable with taking themselves and others into that gray area where there aren't easy answers and, and you're required to sit a little longer in ambiguity. It is a, it is a really, um, it's an important thing for leaders to get comfortable with ambiguity. And then, um, and then I would just suggest that people also just get to know their, I say, know your fingerprint. There are times when people minimize certain things about themselves that make them stand out. Um, if, uh, start playing to your strengths and, and stop focusing on those things that you're not necessarily good at. That sounds like Focus. the sound advice to us, Harold. Thank you so much. Could have talked to you for a much longer. Sigmoidcurve.com if you want more from Harold Hillman. How to beat imposter syndrome. Have a wonderful Sunday, Harold. Talk to you next week.